Thank you. Thank you. So I was, uh, was half expecting to hold a mic. I don't know why. Um, and I was also told that because this is the session before lunch, I ha either have to keep it short or be entertaining. And I'm not sure I'm going to get either of those fronts. Um, I do like to ad lib a bit when I'm speaking. So even though I'm going to be having my slides, I'm probably going to go off on a rant. I get excited, so hopefully you guys get excited too. And I'm going to be talking a little bit about the REST API and how we're using it. We've been hearing a lot about um, using the REST API as a headless CMS. Um, we, we're working on a project that takes it a little bit further than the typical, OK, I'm going to build a theme that's going to interact with the API. Or I'm going to build something else that inter interacts with the API. We actually have machines that are interacting with the API that are doing fancy stuff on the side and writing that content back to the API. So I'll go through the project. And it all started with a script. And I'm going to bring up someone's face. He didn't know that he's going to feature. There he is, Luke. Um, Luke came to me uh, a little while ago now, and he said, I need you to build me this thing. And the idea was that it was going to start with a, a script that was going to do a whole bunch of stuff on the side. And I said, okay, well, that's great. What do you want me to do with it? And he said, I want to, inside Slack, type a message. It needs to go off, run the script, and then get me some results and bring that back into Slack. And I thought about this, and I looked at Slack's API and looked around of how can I solve this problem. And I went back to Luke and said to Luke, um, how about I build an API instead of just building a, a script that runs on the side? That way you can have your Slack bot, and we can do some other things with it as well. Sorry, Luke, you still don't have your Slack bot. Um, but we are building an, an architecture where you can have a lot of things that start to make use of this API. And OK, this is going to be my representation of what the API looks like. Um, it is a little bit more evolved than that. Um, so we're starting with the WordPress REST API. And we looked at a number of ways that we're going to use the WordPress REST API. Um, when we started this project, um, I think it was before the content endpoints were inside um, core. And it was just after the REST API came into core. So it was an exciting time to start looking at this project and how we're going to start building this project. Uh, there's a number of iterations that we went through as we started building this to the point where I was just going, I'm just going to use Laravel. <laughs> um, um, but in on, all honesty, what we ended up doing was we did use WordPress because we're a WordPress agency and all of our experience, I mean, we've got, uh, Luke, someone correct me, but we've got about 50 people that have WordPress experience. And WordPress API made the most sense in that regard to use that as the platform that we're going to build on. And as we started building on it, um, I got really excited about what we can do with the WordPress REST API, rather than just saying, OK, we're going to build a theme that drives the, the, the content. So we started to think, how can we have other things interact with the API? And the, the nature of the product we're building is that it's going to get some lightweight data from the API, but we do need to do some heavy lifting on the side. And so there's a whole lot of processing that's going to happen, and we don't really want that to happen on our WordPress instance, and we definitely don't want that to happen on a request. So we want a lightweight API that can trigger a machine that's going to do the heavy lifting and write that content back into our API. So for when we started building this, um, one Engineers had quite a bit of skill in Symfony, and he started to use Symfony as a framework. And Symf the Symfony app that we wrote is doing the heavy lifting, and then that would write all the data back to the API. As part of the architecture, we thought, well, we don't want constant connection between Symfony and the API. We want some kind of a middleman so we can actually determine if the jobs that we want executed has actually been executed. And for this, we started ending up having a job server. We started thinking about how can we write this job server. In the end, we decided, well, Amazon SQS is going to be our friend. So we're going to make use of Amazon SQS. And any incoming requests that require some heavy lifting is going to send that job to SQS. SQS is then going to be polled by our server that does the heavy lifting. 
it will pick up that job and write that data back to the API. I'm going to start making the connection. So we have incoming requests. The jobs get sent to SQS. Symphony polls those jobs from SQS. So as a job comes in, it gets dropped off the queue. We start doing the processing. Then we have that data being written back to the API. Now, writing the data from Symphony back to the API has a lot of complications. I don't know how many of you have started playing with the REST API. Um, maybe just a show of hands. Anyone who's done some dev on the, dev on, on the API? Yep. A few. Um, how many of you have done it with plugins on the same site? Okay, that's fairly easy. You can just make use of cookie authentication and rely on the REST API to take care of things. Um, same thing if you've done themes. If you've done themes that drive the REST API, you don't have to worry too much about authentication. That kind of happens on, on the same instance. But when you're talking about having other clients, like a Symphony app coming in to the API, we do need to worry about authentication. Because that API, that, what am I going to, I'm going to call this a, a processing server, just so that I can just keep talking about the processing server. So the processing server has to authenticate with the API if it was going to get any data from it, or if it was going to write any data to it. Um, how many of you that have worked with the REST API had to use authentication? Okay, so a few of you. Okay, so you've, uh, there, there's a few plugins out there. There's, um, there's, what is it, the application key plugin that, that, that's out there. There is one for JWT authentication that's out there. Um, I do believe that there's some work on an OAuth um, plugin that's, that's, that's happening that's seeming quite exciting as well. But what we found when we started doing this is that we actually had no idea at first how are we going to do this authentication. And being a fan of exploring different web technologies, um, I'm a big fan of Firebase. I realized that we had some cool JWT libraries for PHP. So I ended up using some of the Firebase APIs um, to, to, to pull libraries, sorry, to pull that in and then do the JWT authentication, but I still needed to authenticate before I could generate my tokens. And for that, there, um, I used the existing uh, API that's a uh, plugin that's available on WP.org for doing the application key authentication and did some modifications so that I could generate Java web, or JSON web tokens. So there's a lot of things to think about when you start to interact with the API and you're not running on the same instance. Other issues that we had to consider was the rate limiting of the API, which I also heard rumors that that's actually now go looking, getting looked at at being incorporated somehow, rate limiting. Um, but we had to deal with rate limiting ourselves as well. With all of this happening, and excuse me if I'm racing, um, I've been accused of racing in talks a lot of times. With this, we needed to think, okay, well, we need to track some every reporting along the way as well. So we ended up using Greylog. I mean, there is Sumo Logger out there, some other services that we could use as well. But we ran an instance of Greylog for every report. And any kind of errors that we detect along the way gets written to Greylog so that we can monitor anything that goes wrong inside the API. Which means that in this case, we actually let leverage the API of Greylog and wrote from WordPress to Greylog instead of the other way around, which made it a little bit easier. Um, what have I got next? We also created a Vue.js-based uh, Vue front end for our API so that people can actually submit their jobs. So th that's the only human component out of this system where there's a person coming in that's writing to the API. And then we built the infrastructure to support other kinds of clients. So a plugin as a client, which is something that, that's being built. We haven't finished that one yet. We also are working on partner integrations to integrate with our API, just some details from the API and write things to the API. As the client integrations happen, that goes through that whole process, does the heavy lifting, comes back to the API. So a lot of integration with machines that we are doing with our API. I think 
before I go any further, I might open it up for some questions. So if there's some questions, just yell them out. I'll just repeat the questions so far. I'm just giving you an overview. I can come back to the slides later. But I'm going to tell you how we started building this. So if there's no questions, I'll talk a little bit, and I can come back to these slides later. One question. All right. Go for it. Okay. So I don't know if any of you had a chat with Luke recently. Um, Luke might have started to mention the, this concept of something called Tide. Has anyone heard Luke speak of Tide before? No? No. Okay. So over the conference so far, there's been some, a lot of talk about security and the threat of plugins. And the general vibe that I get from anyone who talks about plugins, just installing plugins willy-nilly, is that plugins are bad. And that's not the case. Bad plugins are bad. Good plugins are generally good. So the service is actually going to take a plugin, run it through a number of automated tests, check it for performance, check it for um, code standards, and um, check it for coverage to make sure that the the quality of the plugin is of a high quality, and it, um, it's a performant plugin, and it doesn't have a lot of security risk. And then, based on the information that we get back from that, we're going to rate it under each one of those categories and give an overall result back that can be measured on whether or not a plugin is a viable plugin to install in your system or not. So that is what that system is doing. So hopefully that's the context you were looking for. Now, now I can stop being cryptic. Um, it's not a sales pitch. That's all out of the way now. Okay. So as we start to look, look about the service that we're building, we're thinking, well, how can we dream bigger for the service? And one of the things that I've got a prototype for is a data mining client that I've written in, in Go. And the reason I've used Go for this is because Go does a lot of parallel processing at the same time. And I can take a large volume of data, do a whole bunch of processing with that, and write those results straight back into the, the pending jobs. Or I can take it straight back to the API um, without having to go through a slow process of get this plugin, do the processing, get this plugin, do the processing, get this plugin, do the processing. Um, so we can do some data mining. Um, and we might have to have a talk to the uh, WordPress meta guys about this. Um, but there will be some idea of grabbing everything that's in the repo and actually rating it. Um, other than that, we could build a mobile client where you could walk into a situation and you talk to your client and they say, well, I'm thinking of installing this plugin. And you can grab the mobile client and go, plugin, um, this actually rates pretty bad for security. How about we think about another plugin that you can use instead of this one? So there's, there's a lot of verticals that we can actually build on top of this. Okay, so with that out of the way, why an API? So if you think back to where I started, Luke said, I've got the script. I want you to build something for me. Ten minutes, thank you. Okay. And I want to integrate it with Slack. So the whole premise was that it started with an API, but it didn't start with ours. It was a script, but a script is not, you can't leverage a script um, to provide more services just based on a single script. So that's where the idea of an API came from. Where did we start, or where do we start when we start developing a service like this? Documentation. So... <laughs> I know, typically we start, I've got an idea, I'm going to go in, I'm going to build some code, I'm going to build something. When I started looking at this API, I wanted to build an API that at some stage should not depend on me being the developer of this API. I need to have all of the API endpoints documented so that someone else can come in and pick up the project if I can't pick up that part of the project. So looking at documentation there, how do we document an API? And there's different um, tools out there that we can use. I don't know, anyone ever heard of Swagger before? Yeah, there's a few. Um, so Swagger is an um, API definition language, if you will, and that allows you to document your API. Um, there's API Blueprint. There's a few others as well. Um, 
I'm a big fan of Markdown, so when I saw that API Blueprint used Markdown, I was, that was my tool of choice. Um, but the other thing is that um, typically, Swagger is used as a bottom-up type um, documentation tool. It's not, it's not true in a sense completely, like Swagger can be used top-down, but it usually depends on your API already existing, and then you're documenting your API. And there's, there's, there's a good reason for using Swagger in that whenever your code changes and you make, change your documentation, your, your API documentation updates. API Blueprint's the other way around. You first design your documentation, and then someone's going to look at the documentation and implement it. But the drawback is when your code changes, it's not going to update your API. You have to manually then go and update your API. So there's pros and cons, but in the end, we ended up using API Blueprint. Now, how was it developed? It started being test-driven developed. Now, I said started because I'll, I'll get to a bit where it stopped being test-driven. Um, but it started with being test-driven developed, and that was simply going through the, the API documentation, and wherever I had an endpoint, and I had certain requests to that endpoint, the, the payload that I'm going to give and the results that I expect was very clear, and I was able to create tests around that. So I wrote tests that failed, and then started making the test pass. That was our proof of con concept, and when we did it, it like I said, it was pre-content endpoints inside core. We created everything using custom endpoints, and that was that was that was nice. Um, then the update to core came. Content endpoints were in there, and we thought, hang on, there's already been a lot of work done on content endpoints on the controllers and we're going to start using some of the, these technologies instead. So for our MVP, we shifted a little bit in our development, and we started to use the content endpoints with the odd custom endpoint as well. And that is where documentation probably fell flat, and some of our test-driven design fell flat, because some of these tests were already written. It's part of core, part of the core test suite, and a lot of it has already been documented. Um, I do want to give kudos to the documentation team. It, it is fairly well documented. But they were the odd thing that I came across, and fortunately, Ryan, Ryan was around to help with one particular issue that I had a problem with. And Ryan said, no, the documentation says do this. And I did that, and it still didn't work. And then we found a hole in the documentation, and that got fixed. And documentation team updated that, and, and we're pretty happy with that. So our MVT... MVP then ended up being driven by content endpoints and the odd custom endpoint. Uh, I can go back to the other slide, but I think that's, that's just the architecture that we built. I'll explain the, kind of the tool that we're going to build, and I'll open it up for some, some questions now. So, how much is that? I've got plenty of time for questions. So, feel free to ask questions. Please do ask questions. Otherwise, I'm just going to stand here. You're probably good, but then you could, but they're not interoperable. You can ab abandon it. Yeah. Well, it's actually it's probably not a bad idea. I mean, you could do you could use API Blueprint for your top-down design. You, when you start writing your code and you start to implement um, all of the endpoints, you, you, you could start documenting your code with Swagger. So that at the end of it, the day, you could use the Swagger tools to spit out your API, your, your API um, language. Yep. It's more work. If you, if, if you go ahead and learn the, the structure of Swagger, you'd probably just use Swagger in a top-down kind of mode as well. 
Can I do it what, sorry? Can I run it through the diagram? Okay, so how, how do, deep do I dive, Luke? How deep do you want me to dive? Can I go really deep? Okay, all right. So on a very, very, very simple basis, someone comes to the website and says, I've got this plugin. I don't know if it's safe. They interact with our front end and they hit upload and they upload the plugin. The job gets created, gets sent up to SQS as a to be executed. Um, Symphony comes and it pulls that data um, from SQS and then does the processing. Checks it for performance, checks it for security, goes through unit tests, etc. Then it writes that data back to the API. When the data gets written to the API, then we will respond and send um, a message back to the client, whether it be via email, however we're going to handle that part of the, uh, of the notification. So that's, that's the simple way. The other way that it could work with partner integration, um, each kind of um, test that we run has privacy settings. So we lock it down to a partner. We don't want to expose you know, your plugins from, you know, to the plugins over here. So a partner integration would be that here is a set of plugins that I have want you to audit it. So the partner side sends the plugins, goes through the same process, details comes back. That detail is now available to the partner through the API. Um, plugin could be any plugins that have available public data. That data could be pulled via a plugin. So that, that's, that's one way that all of that comes through. I mentioned a lot of data mining. We've got a whole repo full of plugins, and we don't know whether we can trust those plugins or not. With data mining, we could actually go through every plugin in the repo after, um, and do it periodically. And if there's a new update, we can, go, we can update that plugin. We don't have to do all the plugins every time, but we can do plugins as they get updated and get results. And because it's public, that results could be public. So it's essentially what it is. <laughs> Not my job. Not my job. <laughs> well, it actually happens here. Yep. The other thing is that you know, obviously this has to be a very scalable um, system. We have to look at rate limiting on how we, we limit uh, the requests coming in. Um, there's got to lot, be a lot of uh, thought about how we cache um, results as well. Um, but the way that we built this, um, Docker was mentioned at some stage in this conference. Every one of those instances in our setup runs um, on, a doc on a Docker image. So we can actually replicate the whole system as we need to replicate the system. So th you know, there, there could be the API that is actually public, but there's nothing stopping you from making that an internal um, system as well. Ah, uh, Luke. Ah, uh, well, we the, 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 the brain of Tide, the names, right? Um, but essentially, the, the, the thinking behind that is that, um, what is it, a rising tide lifts all boats. A rising tide lifts all boats. So the idea is that um, we want to make something that can actually impact the community and actually um, tell the community that, hey, 
there are some plugins out there that probably could do a bit more work. So let's, let's, let's all actually lift our game and produce better code um, and make it safer and more, um, make it less scary to install plugins. Yeah, yeah, please do. Mm. That, that's the that's that's the yeah that's 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 the vision that that's the view before i answer that question i just want to uh say one thing that um when when rob was speaking and saying it's for all developers and to lower the barrier of entry like to set up your your code sniffs and to to use pre-commit hooks and things like that developing code you know that that that's scary stuff for developers but if you had your zip file you've made your plugin you have your zip file you can come here, you upload your code, it tells you, gives you a report saying, well, these areas of your plugin you can actually improve on without making that data available publicly. So it says, hey, I see your code here, but here are some areas of improvement. <sighs> Probably WordCamp Sydney uh, last year around this time. Um, probably the, the big changes I would make would be how we've built our auditing. Um, other than that, I would probably make the system fairly similar. Not much has changed. No. Yep. And, and the, the best thing about using WordPress um, REST API for this is that every component is um, replaceable. So if, you, if, if somewhere down the track we, we don't want to use Graylog anymore, well, throw it out bring something else in. If we don't want to use Symfony, throw it out, bring something else in. Um, if we don't want to use SQS and we want to use, uh, I don't know, some custom job queue that we've built on Firebase, well, we can do that. So it's the whole system is meant to be interchangeable. I'm going to pass that one over to Luke. <laughs> and no, 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 it's, 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 it's a fairly valid question, but the, the, the answer is going to be here. It's going to be our partners. Um, and it's going to be whether, um, you know, whether we speak to, to the meta team and the meta team wants to start adopting as the theme review team, the plugin review team, whatever, that, that, that's other talk. But before we can do any of that, we have to show 
how this works. Ah, uh, Ryan, I thought you would speak up. <laughs> well, I thought, well, a lot of what we're using is, uh, you know, we, we, talk, we, we have machines talking to each other. OAuth typically requires a human interaction. Um, and then an OAuth server that you can authenticate with. Well, we, we could do OAuth on the side and have an authentication server and um, get someone to authenticate their, their app with the human interaction. We, we could do that. Um, for the sake of an MVP and the sake of a proof of concept, using JWT was the quickest way that we could actually bring this, um, move this project forward. Um, so that's probably the, the primary reason we went down that track. Um, the reason we use JWT and not just straight application passwords well that should be obvious it's it's not secure so at least at, at least we we minimize that by saying well our first request is probably going to be an insecure one but then you're going to get your your JWT and then theoretically that should be more secure yep Okay, so um, I don't know how much you know about the WordPress REST API. Okay, so in the WordPress REST API now, um, as of recently, what, what, what was it, 4.7? So as of 4.7, content endpoints was something that was not part of WordPress core that's been brought in. And that's what gives you the ability to do via a, a REST API request, say, for this content type, I want to get, I w I want to get that, that content. Please give me that content. So that, that would be a content endpoint that we then hit with a request and say, please give me your content. And then that would give you the, the payload that you're asking for. Um, so that the content endpoints are, you know, that, that allows you to get things from, about posts, get you, allows you to get things about your metadata, gets, allows you to get things about your users, etc. We're focused on the content, obviously. So we typically only use the content endpoints. We had to customize um, the controller that actually writes to that content endpoint, and, that, and that's, I mean, that's, that's what we do as developers. We, we, we take what we have and we extend on it. Um, so, so that's the endpoints that was introduced in 4.7. Custom endpoints is something that allows me to go, that, well, you know, the, con the content endpoints that is in core doesn't give me everything that I need. So I need some customization. I need to maybe say, well, I actually have a batch of these, this data that I've wrapped up in, say, maybe 100 pieces, and I want to write one single endpoint, and that endpoint's going to deal with the data for me. I would create a custom endpoint for that. Um, that is not necessarily part of core. So we, we try to keep custom endpoints for MVP to a minimum and actually use what core has to offer us because the REST team has done a terrific job. Um, yes. <laughs> uh, probably probably the, the, the biggest thing that, that annoyed me was the payload that I got back. Um, that there are certain bits of that data that I didn't need that would, would have been handy to just go, look, give me that content. But, you know, if I modify my controller, I just want to say, don't give me these fields as part of my payload. Um, we had to write our custom controller to strip out that data. But if I could just say, Here's an array of fields I don't require. That would have been handy. So th th that that's probably one area. I don't know. Dan, you also did some work on that. Is there anything that, about the REST API that was annoying? <laughs> Yeah. 
No, cool. You guys did a good job. Well, a lot of it would be probably start around the WordPress standards. I mean, there's a lot of WordPress standards already available, and if you develop your plugins and themes according to those standards, you, you are generally, um, well, generally your plugins should be, or themes, should be of a fairly high quality. Um, so we focus at least on, on, on the standards that are required, as, that are documented on the WordPress de in the de WordPress developer handbook. That's where we start. But there's nothing stopping us from going that. Look, we, we, we actually have our own, our, our own thoughts on some things that we want to check for. Um, and that can be customized. That can be, you know, a partner might come to us and say, look, I don't care about this WordPress standard stuff. Um, I wanted to, to look for these specific things. And we can create those, uh, those um, tests. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we'll give you the algorithm. Now, one of the things we should say is that, like, end users will probably love all of this. Plugin developers are probably looking at me grunting. Bad plugin developers, <laughs> plug developers are going to look at me and, and grunt. Uh, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not data mining Code Canyon. I'm data mining the org repo, the dot org repo. I don't see why not. We'd be open to that feedback. If you say to me that this plugin that you've given a score of 95 for performance is actually really, really sluggish on my, on, on my system, then you know, we, we could look at it and go, okay, well, maybe there is something in the algorithm that we need to change. So, I mean, that, that's why we say our, our algorithm is going to be open. And you can say, well, hang on, you haven't considered this, 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 and this. And then we would go, okay, well, maybe we put that in a backlog and go through it and go, okay, Maybe we did miss something. Let's update that and l let's see if that makes a change to the rating of that plugin. So, you know, we, 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 want, we want feedback. Like, this is not, not, not going to be closed. Yeah, that's cool. Reina, thank you. <laughs> Thanks.